Hello, I'm Andy Alabastro, Director of Coalition Relations at the Heritage Foundation. I'm pleased to welcome you to Teaching American Exceptionalism and Overcoming Impediments to Teaching the History We Need. I'd like to welcome those of you joining from the Resource Bank Network, our closest friends and allies and conservative leaders. We're used to convening in person this time of year, but we're pleased to offer these substantive discussions and expert analysis through the virtual platform. We're also pleased to partner with the Fulmer Institute, our colleagues who are focused on restoring confidence in America's founding values and principles and reinvigorating civic culture and national purpose. I'd like to also welcome members of the public. Our public programs team has a full suite of robust programming, and you can always find those events at heritage.org slash events. This session is being recorded and will be posted on resourcebank.org within the next 24 hours. All attendees are in listen-only mode. We want your questions and we encourage you to submit them through the questions box. You can find that on the right hand side of your screen. We also encourage you to identify yourself and your organization so we can say hello throughout the conversation. Uh, pleased to have with us a few special guests today, Dr. David Bob, Dr. Jeffrey Sakanga, Dr. Lindsay Burke, and our moderator, Angela Saylor. I invite them now to turn on their cameras as I give brief introductions. David is the president of the Bill of Rights Institute. David joined the Bill of Rights Institute as president in 2013 and has worked for 20 years at the intersection of civic engagement and education reform. David has taught at Boston College and Hillsdale College. He's designed online education programs used by more than half a million participants and is a national, nationally recognized expert and proponent of civic education. Jeff is executive director of the Ashbrook Center and professor of political science at Ashland University. Jeff has been a senior fellow at the Program on Constitutionalism and Democracy at the University of Virginia, a visiting scholar at Stanford University's Hoover Institution, and the William E. Simon Distinguished Visiting Professor at the School of Public Policy at Pepperdine University. Lindsay is Director of the Center for Education Policy at the Heritage Foundation, where she oversees Heritage's research and policy on the full suite of education issues, preschool, K-12, and higher ed reform. Lindsay is a frequent guest across all media, and she speaks on education reform issues across the country and internationally. Angela Saylor is our moderator. Angela is Vice President of the Fuller Institute at the Heritage Foundation. She's an executive with 20 plus years of experience. She's worked in the corporate world, nonprofits and NGOs, all in leadership roles and on national campaigns. And she has promoted policy through the public sector at the federal, state and local level. We're pleased to have all of you here today. I'll now turn the conversation over to Angela. Uh, good morning, everyone. And I'd like to just at the top, as always, to thank our president, Kate Holtz James, my colleagues, uh, Bridget Wagner and Andy Alavestro, uh, for all the hard work that they do here at the Heritage Foundation. And again, welcome to you. Uh, this is our second forum in a series of three on preserving the legacy of American um, of, of America through civics. At, but today our focus is teaching American exceptionalism and overcoming the impediments to teaching the history that we need. The research, the data, and the analysis continue to warn us about the negative trends uh, in civic literacy among American adults, college students, and even our students K through 12. The Annenberg Civic Knowledge Survey, the American Council of Trustees Survey, and the American Bar Association's Civic Survey all continue to present findings that Americans are lacking significant knowledge about our constitutional rights, as well as topics that involve American history and our representative democracy. The, date, the debate for uh, civic knowledge versus civic action continues, but most agree that teaching American history and transferring the understanding of American exceptionalism is necessary for preserving our legacy of freedom. Our panelists today believe that this formula, or that the formula that is essential to teaching American civics is rooted in keeping it local, ensuring that parents are involved and have options, and that the quality uh, of, of teachers and the curriculum is preserved along with insisting on accountability. Ladies and gentlemen, I will like to uh, begin to present our panelists again to you. Lindsay Burke, who is the Director of Heritage's Center for Education Policy, will give us an update on the current state of education policy and provide us with insight about some of the hot issues we need to watch for. 
Following her remarks, uh, you will hear from David Bob, who is president of the Bill of Rights Institute. And he's gonna talk about the incredible work uh, that they've been doing with teachers and parents in terms of providing outstanding resources that uh, the American public can depend on uh, to help teach truth about who we are as a nation. And followed by him will be Jeff Sakenga, who's executive director at Ashbrook. And again, to you, Jeff, congratulations on your new position. And we look forward to your presentation and hearing about all the wonderful things um, that you all are doing to really dig in on teaching kids way beyond just the basic facts of information, just data points, to helping them internalize those principles um, so that they become a part of who they are. So Lindsay, over to you. Great. Well, thank you, Angela, and thanks to everyone for joining us today. I'm just thrilled to be a part of this panel. Uh, it, it's such an important issue. So I thought we might want to situate it a bit uh, with a little bit of history, right? Why do we have the public education system that we have today? If you go way back, right, to the late 19th century, a driving force behind the establishment of district public schools in America was to cultivate civic values in students. If you look at Horace Mann, right, Horace Mann is commonly referred to as the father of the common school movement, which of course these were proto-public schools of the day. He compared Republican government with, un with uneducated citizens to the equivalent of an insane asylum. <laughs> so he was very focused on this idea of public education as cultivating civic values in students. And so that really was the primary stated rationale for taxpayer funded public schools in the late 19th century to form good citizens. So the question I think for us today is partly whether or not this district model of public schooling has lived up to that mission. And as Angela alluded to a minute ago, if we look at data points like the NAEP civics results that were released last month in April, in my opinion, the answer is a resounding no, unfortunately. When you look across the country, just 24% of eighth grade students performed proficiently on that most recent National uh, Assessment of Educational Progress, NAEP civics exam. And that figure is not significantly different than it was 20 years ago in 1998 when they administered it. I think what is even more concerning is the fact that 25% of those students, a quarter of those students perform below basic in history and geography and civics. So what does that mean? That means that they can't identify a right guaranteed by the Bill of Rights. It means that they can't explain two ways that Congress fulfills its constitutional responsibility. It can't, they can't identify the purpose of the Constitution. These are major deficiencies that we're facing right now. When the results came out last month, Education Secretary Betsy DeVos said her quote was, in the real world, this means students don't know what the Lincoln-Douglas debates were about, nor can they discuss the significance of the Bill of Rights or point out basic locations on a map. So how do we correct course? I would argue that school choice is one, if not the primary way to begin correcting course. Take for example, Great Hearts. The Great Hearts Network is a network of classical charter schools operating largely throughout Arizona as well as in Texas. And what Great, Heart, what Great Hearts does as a network of classical charter schools, is they focus on deep reading of the great books, great works of literature that have stood the test of time. And like everything that Great Hearts does, that means instilling civic literacy is accomplished by reading those masters. So students read, for example, and digest the Federalist Papers, they engage in discourse on the early American Republic. They read Mark Twain and Nathaniel Hawthorne and Washington Irving to understand the American experience. And they situate it in the broader historical context that informed the founding. And that includes deep reading of Roman and Greek authors as well. So by the time students reach high school, they're reading in depth our founding documents. They read the Federalist Papers in Tocqueville, and then they eventually begin working backward to read those Roman and Greek authors. So if we look at the Great Hearts curriculum, among so many other foundational documents that they're reading, 
they read the Declaration, they read the Constitution, but they also read seminal court cases throughout American history. They read the Monroe Doctrine and the Emancipation Proclamation and the Gettysburg Address, but those papers are couched among a reading list that to me is so impressive for high school students. They're reading Democracy in America, the Second Treatise of Government, the Iliad, the Odyssey, the history of the Peloponnesian War. Students make their way through Plato's Republic, through Aristotle, Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, the Divine Comedy, the Aeneid. And so what is the result then for students at Great Hearts? Great Hearts students are doing great when it comes to history. The Philanthropy Roundtable recently listed Great Hearts among its top classical and charter schools that are bolstering civics instruction and civics education. So in my opinion, choice really is a big part of the equation. If we return back to those NAEP results for just a second, if we look at civics outcomes specifically, 41%, 41% of Catholic school students tested proficient versus 23% of public school students. So we can't draw causal inferences from that NAEP data, but the literature is replete with studies that have controlled for the impact of the background characteristics of families who send their children to private school. And that literature does demonstrate that private schools either match or exceed public schools in teaching civics. For example, researchers Patrick Wolf and Corey DeAngelis conducted a review of the literature and they looked at all of the rigorous studies that have examined the effect of private schools on civic outcomes. And they found that private schools have a positive effect on tolerance, on charitable giving, on political participation, and on volunteerism. So in other words, private schools, along with charter schools, and I would say just broadly private school choice programs, are outperforming district schools on civics, as well as those character values like tolerance and charity and volunteerism that are really critical later life outcomes and that mark the formation of good citizens. But I will end with this, a caution perhaps, and then turn it over to Dr. Bob that we can't, even if we are focused on private school choices, we should be, right? Fundamentally, Angela mentioned, you know, what's the policy? Fundamentally, the policy is about moving away from a government run, government assigned, system of district public schooling and instead funding families and allowing families to select into learning options that are the right fit with their child's needs. And that has to be our primary focus. But at the same time, we cannot abandon to the left the content that is taught in more than 100,000 public schools across the country. That also has to be part of our charge. So I'll stop there for the moment and turn it over to Dr. Bob. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Burke. Thank you to Angela, to Andy, and to the Heritage Foundation for this opportunity to address uh, this really important subject. I wanted to start with a quotation from George Washington, who wrote this in, in the year 1777. We should never despair. Our situation before has been unpromising and has changed for the better. So I trust it will again. If new difficulties arise, we must only put forth new exertions and proportion our efforts to the exigency of the times." End quote. The opportunity before us, even in the time of coronavirus in civics and history, I think is, is significant. We stand at a time when our nation is divided people are feeling the ill effects of that division. And I think the question that we really uh, are addressing in this, in this session and look forward to, to hearing from, from all of those who are, who are, who are viewing what, what's on your mind is how do we bring the principles of the Declaration of Independence, the promise of, a liberty, of liberty and equality for all? Because after all, when, when General Washington's writing those words, that's what he's fighting for. That promise was made in the Declaration of Independence, and it has been over the years, decades, and centuries fought for. It is still not fully realized, but that's something that civic education is really particularly geared to be able to do, to equip young people today, to be able to equip Americans of all ages to say, we share in this promise. 
we hold it up. We say that it's something that has to be affirmed, that liberty and equality for all is something that's hard to do. And I think what's remarkable about the country in which we live, the United States of America, is that we put that promise at the heart of our regime. We have not always lived up to those ideals, but there was no group of people more acutely aware of that than those men and women who originally fought for those ideals. And I think that's something that we can take with us even as we discuss these topics of how do we recover really the, 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 the principles of the American founding. Because ultimately those principles are true for that age and our age and every age. And that doesn't mean that they're always uh, fully realized. Uh, somebody that has been an inspiration to me and to my colleagues at the Bill of Rights Institute is Frederick Douglass. He stood in that long uh, lineage of, of individuals who knew very deeply what the principles of the Declaration mean, but also knew acutely how long we had to go in realizing and fighting for them. Uh, Douglas said this, uh, truth is powerful. A single individual armed with truth is a majority against the world. That's a really profound thing. And that's what we try to do at uh, the Bill of Rights Institute, which is support teachers, support students, and give them an invitation to this American experiment. I wanna mention just a couple of things via, via three uh, uh, sort of snapshots of, of the resources that the Bill of Rights Institute makes available to teachers across the country. We support district school teachers, charter school teachers, those who are teaching uh, in the homeschool setting, those who teach in parochial schools, all of the above, as Lindsay said. That's such an important thing and a rich part of the American experiment what civics and history really needs to become even more, I think, is something that's shot through all of the curriculum. Great Hearts Academy does that beautifully. And what we try to do is support those entrepreneurial educators in whatever educational setting they're in to meet the needs of their students, primarily those who are in high school and middle school. So if you see in, in, in front of you, teach.mybri.org is a, a website that we put together in particular response to the needs that parents and teachers have in the time of COVID-19, in the time of school closures. It's searchable so that you can see uh, uh, any kind of uh, uh, resource that you might need related to the teaching of history, to the teaching of civics, to the teaching of character, because ultimately, you know, we have these documents, the, the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, the formal structure of our country's freedom. We also have an informal constitution. Who are we as a people? Who are we going to become? And it takes the two working together. The formal constitution, the Bill of Rights, even the promise of the Declaration is, as only as, is really only as good as, as, as our character in upholding it. Uh, as the next slide indicates, there's a, a whole array of resources that are available on the Bill of Rights Institute website. I won't go through them all now, but just highlight one, uh, you know, it was 100 years ago, as of August this year, that women for the first time in this nation's history were granted the, the, the right to vote. That's a fascinating story of people who were appealing to the principles of the Declaration to say, this is such an important promise, we want it to extend to everyone. And I think in looking at that, you can also see, how do you do social change within a constitutional setting? That's a hard question. Those are questions that teenagers want to wrestle with. And as the next slide shows, the Bill of Rights Institute is dedicated towards uh, to, to really equipping teachers with, with practical uh, application of these ideas. So Life, Liberty, and the Pursuit of Happiness is a large project that will uh, be launched on July 6th of this year. It, along with Rice University's OpenStax, will afford teachers and parents, anyone who wants to go, the opportunity to see the entire array of the American story and download lesson plans, primary source documents, anything that they need to make that story really come alive. Uh, we've seen even in this week as students across the country take advanced placement uh, exams, that they are eager to dive in. And despite those disappointing NAEP scores, the good news is that there are millions of people in this country who are really engaged in civics, who are living it every day and who are learning those ideas. Uh, let me stop there uh, and I'll turn it over uh, to, to, to my colleague, uh, Dr. Sakenga.
Thanks, Dr. Bob, and thanks for having us here, and thanks for sponsoring this panel. It's a, on a really important topic, and it seems to be getting more important uh, every week when we hear about the Pulitzer being given to the 1619 Project, as mentioned already, when we hear about those NAEP scores. Uh, we all know uh, that we have a serious problem in this country with American history and civics. Uh, since you know the Ashbrook Center was inaugurated in 1983 by Ronald Reagan, and it's been our mission ever since then to strengthen constitutional self-government, really by educating our fellow Americans, whether those are students, whether they're teachers, citizens, in the history and principles of our country, and in the habits uh, necessary for self-government. Something David mentioned about the character of the people and the habits of mind necessary for self-government matters. And I, the way Ashbrook has been doing that, we've grown in the last five to 10 years to really expand our outreach to teachers and to realize that the teachers have such leverage, they're such an important part of the education of students in, in reaching and multiplier effect with a number of students. You know, one teacher can teach almost 5,000 students over the course of their career. If we can reach those teachers, we can reach the young people that they teach. So our focus has grown to uh, emphasize really, how do we educate teachers in the best way possible? And what we've realized is the NAEP scores suggest that we do have a crisis. On the surface, it looks like it's a crisis of facts and, and information. But, but as, as David and Lindsay were suggesting, it's more than that. It really is a crisis of understanding and of devotion. And the question you know, is, what does America mean to young people? Is it, is it a good place? Is it a good country or not? And, and those questions, when we ask students that, unfortunately, we find some disappointing answers sometimes. And it stems not because they don't know particular facts, but because they don't have a deep understanding of what is right and good and true and beautiful about America. And so our, our programs are focused on addressing that fundamental underlying crisis of understanding and devotion. And we think that it was, uh, the solution lies in the, the a way of education. And it's exactly the way of education that Lindsay and David were talking about, which is to return to primary sources. That's a, that's a big emphasis that we emphasis, that we stress with teachers and that when they encounter these on our programs, um, a light turns on. They say, well, I don't have to just read about the Constitution in a textbook. I can read the Constitution. And I can, I can understand the Declaration of Independence simply by starting at the beginning and reading it together with my students and just asking a simple question, what does this mean? That those kind of conversations can happen and are happening across the country in classrooms and in homes. And it's that kind of education that's rooted in primary source documents, going back and letting the past speak for itself, that we find and our teachers find so liberating. Uh, they can throw off the shackles of curriculum that's been imposed on them from above and really dig into the fundamental questions of American history. And those questions, what does it mean to be an American? What is liberty? What is freedom? What is equality? And to understand that America, when you tell America's story, you see that it's a story of freedom, that it's a story of a f country founded on freedom, of course, but then its history is a, the history of the struggle, the story of the struggle to achieve that freedom, just as David was mentioning before. And you can see that if you focus on documents like the Declaration of Independence or the Gettysburg Address or Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech. In these critical moments in American history, we find reference back to these fundamental principles. And so there is a way to engage students. We've seen great teachers who do it. They're out there. There are great schools that are doing it. But what we need now, of course, is to take that way of education across the country. And we, it, we need to get it out from the grassroots uh, into schools, into homes. Uh, that's the way we're going to revive understanding and devotion to the country in young people. That's Ashbrook's thinking about it. That's, I know, the thinking of many other groups who are involved uh, in this great and worthy cause. Uh, we have a new initiative that we're launching, and it's on a, a, a snapshot of it here that we have called In the Spirit of 76. 
Uh, and what we want to do is working, of course, with other groups, including the folks here who are with us, to bring this way of education to the country's classrooms everywhere. Lead a second American revolution in America's classrooms. Provide resources and programs for teachers, in-person seminars, webinars. Uh, in this day and age, obviously, those have become even more important. And to have a kind of live conversational interaction on those webinars, replicate as much as possible the kind of conversation that history at its best is always been about. And you know, as you can see on the slide, our goal is not just civic knowledge. That's important. We cannot have, we cannot have civic engagement without civic knowledge. You need to be, we need wise citizens. But um, a, a deep understanding and devotion to the country. And you know, you can't love something unless you think it's beautiful. And if students are taught that America is founded in ugliness and that its history is an ugly history of oppression and nothing but, how can they be devoted to such a country? So we need to tell America's story. We need to let students discover it for themselves. We try to base our programs on the old uh, dictum of Aristotle, all people desire to know. And then we add, but they don't want to be told. They want to discover it for themselves. And so we want classrooms in home schools where students are going back to the past, asking it questions, seeking its answers, and discovering it for themselves. And our initiative here is to take that way of education and go to scale nationally with it. And we're excited about it and delighted to be with you all and to partner with the folks who are here in order to do that. Thanks for having us. Thank you all. Um, just incredible work that you're doing uh, across the entire nation. I want to just circle back um, on the NAEP scores. And as we're doing that to the audience, please feel free to um, post your questions in the question box. We definitely want to engage you in this conversation. Uh, one of the things that we're doing here is we, we want to hear from you and we want this to be a dialogue. But as we're waiting for you to, uh, to post your questions, um, Lindsay, back to you on Nate. Let's just peel the onion back a little bit on this. I mean, our, our session today is, is teaching American exceptionalism and those scores don't seem so exceptional. <laughs> um, and I, I just, I wonder, and I think many are concerned, you know, what do we do with that information? And we look at the amount of time that those numbers haven't been so good, but, but what yeah. do we do with that? And then take that lemon and make it lemonade. Yeah, that's a great question. So you know, I always think about these issues through the policy lens because that's my you know day job is, is thinking about the policy side of it. And to not see these civic outcomes budge for decades now is concerning. But unfortunately, it fits a broader pattern. We have not seen math achievement budge over the past few decades. We have not seen reading achievement budge. If you go half a century back, if you go back to the mid 1960s when Lyndon Johnson was pushing his great society programs. And if you look at achievement gaps between children from low income families, so the bottom 10% by income of families compared with that top decile of families, there was the equivalent of, of about four grade levels of learning difference between those top and bottom uh, income distribution uh, students. And so four grade levels, that's a huge amount of, of uh, difference in learning. And so we see all of these federal programs promulgated, we see all of these state programs promulgated and all of the attendant federal spending. And yet today, the gap remains the equivalent of four grade levels worth of learning. So we have not seen that academic achievement gap budge. And unfortunately, these NAEP civics outcomes fit that trend, um, just as with everything else. And so, you know, I always sound like a broken record, but Angela, you mentioned the word accountability when we kicked off, and that is quite the buzzword in education policy circles. Uh, but this word accountability is, is really critical. And we have to think about accountability in a context of accountability for what and to whom. For so long, particularly in the wake of the 65 Great Society, accountability has been conceptualized as this vertical accountability to Washington through things like standards and state tests, et cetera instead of choice-based accountability, which creates the ability for parents to vote with their feet 
and creates that horizontal accountability to those families. And so until we start to reconceptualize how we think about accountability, moving it away from that vertical accountability to bean counters in Washington toward that horizontal accountability that's created through robust widespread choice, I don't think, unfortunately, we're gonna see those outcomes change. Thank you, thank you. So um, David and Jeff, do you wanna jump in on this, on that question about Nate, just to peel the onion back a little bit in terms of you know, how that really resonates um, for, for teachers and, and for parents and, and the work that you're doing? Civics starts at home. You know, civics is something that is not mainly fifth period uh, class that meets uh, and you try to get done with it as quickly as possible. But because we have sometimes in our country uh, placed such a, a, a premium on the recitation of, of facts, kids have gotten a sense of it that, boy, if I just memorize this stuff, then, then maybe they'll leave me alone. Uh, we had a program recently for a group of teachers, and at the end, one of them said, because at the centerpiece of it was that Socratic mode, really pushing into the why. And this gentleman said, I've just transformed my education. Not somebody else transformed it, he did. And he's gonna take that back into the classroom. And I think what's so important is that we get to the, the, the place where our, our, our young people naturally push us, which is why, why does this matter? It does not devalue the content acquisition. That is so important. We should continue to measure that. But it's as important that the students are able to name the three branches, or as important as that they can name that, that, that they would also be able to tell you why does that matter. And it's, it's great to bring it around, of course, to why does this matter for me? So I think what we're trying to do in the civic education arena is really bring that importance out and let, let young people gain their own voice. That, after all, was the message of somebody like Frederick Douglass. He knew that these things, if they were just abstract principles out there hovering in the ether, they don't matter a bit. We have to get young people excited about these things in a way that says, this idea of freedom and equality for all matters to me, and I want to share it with others in my, in my, uh, in my uh, orbit. Jeff? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And I, I want to agree with what David said there. And it's very, you, you engage students and I think you can turn around these scores. Of course, it's, it's a school at a time. It's a family at a time. It's a build from the bottom grassroots movement. But it, we, we got to focus on the fundamental questions that matter to people. Okay. And and you you'll only digest that information. Students will if if as David said they know why it's important. The the why and history is ultimately about asking questions uh, of the past and and seeking its answers for why things happen. Why are things important? Um, a simple question is America good or bad, and why? You know if you want to measure success, if we had students who graduated high school who said America is good, and I can tell you why. That, that is a fundamental marker for success in our movement. And we are unfortunately not there yet, but you have to engage students with those kind of questions that grab them, that they wanna talk about. They're naturally curious about them. And it's a way of education and posing those questions to them and building curricula around the, those kind of questions that really does engage them. And where schools do that, we do see positive results. Yeah, I, you know, I think the points that you all are making are are just incredibly important. I mean, even in April, April was a hot month um, in terms of, of, of debate and information being exchanged. And we had the Harvard University law professor who sparked some controversy um, on her comments about banning homeschooling. And Jeff, to your point in terms of the, the things that matter and, and getting to the goodness of it all. At the same time, we have this intersection with um, professors saying that homeschooling can lead um, an exposure to white supremacy. Uh, and, and Lindsay, I know that you, you wrote a paper and you, 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 you really commented on this. Why don't you share a little bit about um, your thoughts and 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 um, the impact of moments like this when we're trying to push 
the ball forward um, for positive outcomes. Well, I'm not sure that my comments are safe for TV uh, on that homeschooling article because it was so inflammatory. I mean, it really was just, you know, the antithesis of what homeschooling is really all about. And let me just say the moment that we're in right now with the coronavirus pandemic, what we're seeing with families, I would be careful not to equate this with homeschooling as traditionally conceived, right? Homeschooling typically is parents and families selecting into homeschooling as an option because it's the right fit for them, the right fit for their child, their lifestyle, their job, et cetera. What we have now is families who have all become, somebody had said, accidental homeschoolers. And so this is the current moment that we're in, I would say is quite different than homeschooling as we traditionally sort of think about it. Um, we'll see if it sticks long-term or the extent to which it, it sticks. We have about 1.8 million kids across the country who were homeschooling pre-pandemic. That's about 3% of the population overall. So we'll, you know, just a few numbers so we can have in the back of our mind next year when we look back, we can see, you know, was there an increase overall in homeschooling or did families sort of continue as it was prior to the pandemic? I think we'll see a bit of an uptick, um, certainly. You know, on the, the outcomes, homeschoolers have fantastic academic outcomes. It's a little difficult to capture in uh, research studies because you will never, uh, just to get wonky for a second, you'll never have oversubscription of homeschooling, right? You're always going to have as many seats available to homeschool as there are families who want to homeschool. And so we'll never be able to do a randomized control trial evaluation of homeschoolers. And so that is important because we can't necessarily, or we can't, draw causal uh, inferences from the homeschooling studies. But of the studies of those families who choose to homeschool, the outcomes of those students have been phenomenal. They are overwhelmingly positive of the studies that exist. More than two thirds of those uh, studies, those rigorous evaluations find that homeschoolers uh, perform extremely well academically. They perform well in terms of attainment. So graduation rates, they enroll in college, they are successful in their later life outcomes. So they do a really phenomenal job. So, you know, that that Harvard homeschooling article, you know, setting aside the fact that fundamentally parents are a child's first and foremost educator and there will never be anyone who cares more about their child than the parent. Setting all of that aside, you know, even just on the research, it did not strike the right tone whatsoever and uh, deserves to be called out as such. Yeah. So, David, um in terms of um you know a lot of a lot of the work that you all do at your organization you 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 spend a lot of time trying to make sure that you're bridging people together um so when when we get kind of inflammatory statements like this and um it, from harvard um how 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 do you deal with that as an organization well i think what we find in working primarily with district school educators is that so far from this kind of antipathy towards parents and families being the, the, the first provider of education, they desire that the parents and guardians of the children that are in their classrooms would take up even more responsibility. And I think in terms of that bridge building, there is so much that needs to be done to, to knit together parents and school teachers in whatever educational setting people are in you know uh, learning is not a place it's 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 a it's a frame of mind and civic learning is about that openness to hard conversations these are not easy conversations the question about um what america was about from the beginning begets very quickly some very difficult things, right? We have to talk about the enslavement of human beings. We have to talk about what, what led to the conflict that divided our nation. And you know what? If you put it in terms that say, we still have this promise, this promise that was in the declaration and that promise still holds good, you find that I think people can rally to this. But what I found particularly uh, appalling in this this uh, this report and study was a note of condescension, and I think around that we should all agree. You know, there's a there's a line in the the, the Harvard Magazine uh, article that that uh, this this professor concedes that in some situations homeschooling may be justified and effective. Well, that's nice, right? 
that's not her prerogative to to accord that 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 privilege right and we need to assert and and even as we assert the 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 the, the right uh to, to to educating uh children in the way that parents see fit we should take up the responsibility and knit together the community of people and, and that, that are going to be so important in, in giving them the civic learning that they need well, you know, and, and I, I so appreciate your comments there. And Jeff, I, I want to bring you in on this part of the conversation, but want to blend it with the Pulitzer Prize announcement um, for the essay that um, Nicole Hannah-Jones did uh, for the New York Times 1619 project. Uh, you know, your project has 1776 in it. And um, we are constantly battling this revision, revisionist history deal um, from in terms of philosophy. And I think it is creating a lot of tension as we look at balancing civic knowledge and civic action and where that begins to bleed over into to political activism, if you, if you will. Um, so would you talk a little bit about um, the work you all are doing to push back on, you know, this the the narrative that's coming out of 1619 that that really puts a, a taint on who we are as a nation and and who we will be in for 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 decades and centuries to come. Yeah, I would say that it it's not homeschooling that's divisive. Uh, I think there's far more danger of in, in encountering ideological divisiveness in certain classrooms with mandated curricula. I think you're much more likely in danger of uh, socialist ideology than you are of white supremacist ideology in homeschools. So I, I would say that there's a certain divisiveness when history and civics classrooms in the country are organized around inherently divisive positions. And I think the 1619 Project is, is really a corrosive uh, endeavor that it, it is educationally corrosive because, you know, for one thing, it's all historians will tell you this, it, it, it's bad history to say, uh, to attribute uh, to one cause all effects, right? So just as a matter of being doing history, it's not the right way of doing history. But I, of course it's politically corrosive too because it immediately injects a division in the classroom between peoples and separates peoples rather than draws them together. Uh, on, on certain principles on which we could all agree and hold dear. And I think it's morally corrosive. Uh, people like Bob Woodson have talked about this, that it has a morally corrosive effect when you tell people that America is not a land of hope and promise for you, but is inherently, as, as she says in her introductory essay, has racism in its DNA. Uh, you can't change your DNA. So if that's true, you're going to breed uh, guilt and you're going to breed bitterness. Those are not qualities of character that bring people together. If you go back to 1776 and say, these are principles of freedom and equality that apply to all. And the question is, uh, look at our history as a struggle to try and achieve those imperfect fits and starts, lots of arguments, lots of important disputes. But if we see it that way, Everyone can see themselves in the story of America. And I think that's incredibly important and unifying. We can still argue about policy. We can still argue about political matters, but we, we do it within the framework, a shared framework, a shared American framework that really matters. Yeah, I, I get, you're so right. And and David, you know, the, the way that um, Bill of Rights um, uh, handles issues like this. I mean, you and I've talked about this before in terms of you've got this, um, you've got this the very divisive um, sentiment out there and, and the work that you all are doing, you're trying to like, you're trying to educate, give awareness, bring people together. And I, I love the way that you all are handling um, the response to 1619 in a way that doesn't create um, um, division away from all the people that you're training and, and, and you're providing additional resources for. Could you talk a little bit about, about that? I think it's rooted in an idea that, that an inquiry, which is after all what history is, 
you're making an inquiry, it has to be viewpoint diverse. Uh, I'll give a quick example from the curriculum that 1619 has, has, uh, has, has put out there, created by the Pulitzer Center. Uh, erasure poetry is one of the main things that they advocate should be done. So children taking the Declaration of Independence, erasing text, leaving the sentiment that they feel. So to us at the Bill of Rights Institute, that's not a good lesson plan. That's not sound pedagogy. Because what you should do is first ask the student to confront the ideas in the declaration, learn them deeply, and then you might be ready to offer a criticism. But what you should hear then is people who have studied these things and ask those difficult questions and put point counterpoint. Oftentimes there's more than two views. And at the high school level, students are able to understand that. We find that most of the teachers in the country, and we work with a quarter of the nation's social studies educators in middle and high school, that they wish to have that viewpoint diversity. When they're handed a textbook, it is of this kind of omniscient view. And it's kind of boring too, right? If you're told all the answers, which the 1619 Project does kind of in conspiratorial fashion, or Howard Zinn does, well, what's the student supposed to do then? What is left for inquiry? And I think when you approach this and say, look, all questions are on the table here. We will address all of them, and we're going to take the time to do that. And we're going to, to embrace that kind of dialogue with educators and with parents, and after all, with young people themselves. Let's have at it, but let's look at sound scholarship and rigorous pedagogy. That is the kind of thing that I think is, is, is going to be the path forward, rather than these kind of uh, curricula that say um, are used almost as, as, as wedges. Wonderful. We've got um, a couple of questions in the queue, and Rick Sigman uh, says, as a concerned grandparent, when interacting with public school educators, um, he's asking the question, have you found that public school educators have shown an interest in your efforts? And so I think this question could go to all three of you. Uh, and he says that his perception is that the interest level is not as large as we would hope it would be. So I want to go to you, Jeff, Lindsay, and then back over to you, David. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, there are great teachers out there everywhere in, in public schools as well. My mom was a social sixth grade social studies teacher in a low income school for 42 years. Um, she was a good teacher. And, and I know that because I would go in the classroom with her and the students would tell me that. She's strict, but we really like her. Um, there are great teachers out there doing this. When we go, you know, the primary way that we get our programs to teachers is actually by folks that we have on the ground around the country who go to school districts and say, We're, we would like to offer you a, a seminar on the Declaration of Independence or the Constitution for your teachers. Here's the way we're going to do it. It's going to be rooted in the primary documents. It's going to be a, a conversation and a discussion. And we're going to treat your teachers like the professionals and colleagues that they are. Uh, overwhelmingly, the response is, we would love to have you. We have not found that uh, a kind of systematic resistance. There's sometimes um, skepticism or tell us more about yourself. But no, in fact, we've found that people are open to it. There's a lot of teachers, in, including in the public schools, who are really sick and tired of the kind of professional development opportunities or non-opportunities that they have. And they, they're good people out there who know they're being uh, told a lot of nonsense, but they feel like maybe there's no alternative that that's what they have to endure, but it's not true. So we've found very uh, welcoming uh, environments for us when we go to public schools. It's really important, of course, to talk to them in a way that they understand to not be partisan, to not be ideological, to be honest brokers, to say, we just wanna have a conversation about the meaning of the Declaration of Independence that you can bring back into your classrooms. If you approach it that way, you know, we found them to be actually very receptive. Lindsay. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's great to hear that they've been really receptive. It, it's going to be interesting to see. So before the coronavirus pandemic hit, uh, the um, Pulitzer Center was engaged in getting the 1619 Project into schools, public schools across the country through curriculum. And so it will be interesting to see the extent to which the coronavirus may have disrupted that effort. So just sort of an aside there to see 
uh, down the road, but they had already achieved getting this curriculum into about 3,500 schools across the country. So, and in some instances like Buffalo, New York, the schools are mandating that teachers use that 1619 curriculum. Uh, my colleague at, at Heritage, Mike Gonzalez, though, points out that uh, the curriculum piece of this is both the 1619's greatest threat and its Achilles heel. And I, I think he's right on that. Parents now are going to start to see this a little more. Teachers and parents and students are going to be interacting with the curriculum more and more. Um, certainly the Pulitzer Prize component of this will probably push that forward. And I do think, though, kind of bringing it back to the pandemic, that this is an opportunity for us as well. Um, my colleague Jonathan Butcher in our Center for Education Policy points out that one of the um, opportunities that the virus has presented to parents is their ability to really spend time and do deep dives into the content that their children are being taught in public schools across the country. So hopefully families will take the opportunity to really examine, you know, is, is their school using 1619? What exactly does that mean uh, moving forward? So I, I do think this is an opportunity. And then I'll just note too, we might have even more information to answer that question in a few months. We currently have a survey in the field right now that asks both parents and school board members across the country their opinions of the 1619 project. We pull language verbatim from uh, the New York Times essay and from the broader curriculum resources that are out there, and we test those messages with parents and school board members. So that's forthcoming. We're starting to get results back. It's a nationally representative survey. Uh, done by an outside survey firm. It is, the results are very interesting. That's all I can say at the moment, but we will be releasing those in a, probably a month and a half or two. Okay, so so David, as we go back over to you, there is a, there is a specific question in the queue um, from Maria Zenz, and she's wanting more information um, about how average parents um, can access information from the Bill of Rights Institute. I think just going online, everything we produce is free and available online. And if you go to mybri.org, mybri.org, you can click on uh, the educator resources and find the, the, the curricula that, that um, is really not full of jargon. It's directed in ways that, that can be uh, directly applied in, in a home setting or any setting. Also, if you have a young person in your home, thinkthevote.org is a resource where issues are laid out uh, and in a nonpartisan way, we look at the analysis there, have debates that students can enter into. And what we found is like uh, uh, nearly 6,000 students just entered an essay contest. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, we've talked about some of the things that are, that are frustrating and challenging and, and, and uh, just downright uh, you know, going in the wrong direction, but, what we do see is that there are thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of youth out there and so many teachers that care about that viewpoint diversity. And so we'd love to hear from you. We're looking to, to reach out to more uh, parents and, and meet the needs that you have uh, both in this time and, and, and in, the, in, in the time coming. Great. Well, we are having such a good time and time always flies when you're having fun. But well, we've got one more question in the queue that I'm going to throw out to you, and if you will address it uh, along with your kind of closing remarks, uh, that'll keep us on time. Rachel Mima um, is asking, or she's making a statement as well, she's saying we need um, an equally organized effort to educate our youth about American exceptionalism. We need a strategy, she says. So she'd like each of you, and I'm asking in your closing remarks, to include um, efforts that are underway to organize communities to help spread American exceptionalism. And I'd like to just plug before I go to Lindsay and then David and then Jeff for your closing remarks that on June 2nd, we are having, as I mentioned earlier, the third session in the series on civics. And it will have a great focus on the grassroots organizing um, and bringing people together across the country towards this effort. So I'm going to go to you, Lindsay, and then to David, and then to Jeff. You know, as, as much as uh, I always say school choice, school choice, and I do think that that is the number one way that 
parents can really organize, right? It's having options. And, you know, not only do families uh, have that ability to exercise uh, an education choice option that's the right fit for their child, but we know that there's this sort of downstream effect where families themselves start to organize together. I'll give one quick example. In 2011, when Arizona created the first in the nation education savings account program, which is basically a uh, critical refinement of the original school voucher model, right? It's more piecemeal and you can apply your dollars to multiple education services and products and providers. On day one, the very first thing that we saw were families, largely mothers, uh, whose children were participating in the ESA program, get together, start a Yahoo message board, and start exchanging best practices, what worked well with tutors, what tutors they didn't like, what services were allowed to be uh, to have money spent on in the ESA program, what schools they really liked. And so there was this immediate civil society response from the families that uh, school choice in the case of Arizona catalyzed, so more choice. But beyond that, within the public system, you know, show up at your school board meetings, uh, write letters, go to those PTA meetings. There are so many ways that you can make your voice heard on this really critical issue of curriculum. And then the last thing I'll say, uh, in addition to all of the fantastic resources that we've heard about today from both the Bill of Rights Institute and the Ashbrook Center, you can also go to, uh, if you Google Heritage Foundation and Curriculum Resource Initiative, we have a whole treasure, treasure trove of resources there on not only civics, but any other academic content that you might want to access uh, while you're all schooling from home. All right, uh, over to you, David. I'm glad that in our country, there is no national grand plan for civic education. Uh, we live in a federal constitutional republic and that's a good thing. The strategy is you and communities banding together and in support of the educational efforts that are happening in the home, in the community schools, in charter schools, in every setting that Lindsay has spoken of and that we've talked about today, a robust, conversation dialogue that tackles these hard things and does so in an upbuilding way. You know, one of the, the, the really um, heartbreaking uh, uh, revelations from the latest NAEP exam is that for those children of individuals who have not finished high school, the proficiency rate went from 5% to 4%. And I would challenge everyone who's, who's in this conversation right now to think about people in your community Maybe they're working two or three jobs. You know, how do you reach them and give them some help? Those families that have just become naturalized citizens, can we adopt them, so to speak, and help them with not only meeting their day-to-day -day needs, but the needs that they have for education in, in, in their home to learn what does it mean to be, be an American? And I think if we take some of these steps and, and really build out, we're looking forward at the Bill of Rights Institute to working with uh, the Ashbrook Center and the Jack Miller Center in the state of Florida. And I think there, there needs to be a whole bunch of efforts that are really building this kind of groundswell that say, we'll work with anyone to accomplish these important and, and, uh, and, and, and vital ends. All right, thank you, Jeff. Over to you to close us out on final remarks. Yeah, thanks again for having us. Uh, I would echo what both Lindsay and David have said uh, we, we, I think the strategy is that we need to go directly to where people are. Um, it can't be a top-down solution. That won't work. That'll just be another government mandate. And we, none of us are in favor of that sort of approach. You have to go directly to pe where people are. You need to go directly to where the students are. You need to go directly where the families are. So online resources, for example, you know, they've, they've been important before this situation. They're critical now. But I think we're going to see an acceleration of that trend, actually. So uh, Bill of Rights Institute has a wonderful website. The Ashbrook Center has a website called teachingamericanhistory.org, or just TAH.org. It's a, it's a really large repository of American primary historical documents, letters, speeches, documents that cover the whole span of American history and government. And those are available for free. Um, that you can download and use in, in your homeschool right now that teachers can use and that gets millions of visitors every year uh, to provide direct access to that. So I say go directly to where students and their families are, go directly to where teachers are, 
meet them in their needs. They, they want to be able to teach content and serious good content in a serious way. Go to them and provide those resources. Don't have another top-down mandate telling them what to teach. Let them discover that, go to them, give them the resources, and it does really transform their classrooms. So I think the strategy is grassroots, direct, straight to the folks that we want to influence and build from, from the bottom up, so to speak, not from the top down. And it really does work. Uh, it, it changes lives. It changes the lives of students. It changes families' lives. And it has a significant effect on making people better citizens. So I think that strategy of direct action um, needs to be something that we really focus on and build these coalitions. The, the work that David was talking about with Bill of Rights Institute and the Ashbrook Center in Florida, we hope that that works, becomes a model for other states and other communities to adopt, and we go from there. So we're looking really forward to this. Uh, it's just It might look uh, difficult right now to a lot of people, challenging with the Pulitzer the 1619 project, but just as Frederick Douglass said right after the Dred Scott decision, uh, it never looked brighter than right then because the, our, our opponents have laid bare their intentions. Now it's up to us to take the initiative and go to them. Wonderful. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Lindsey Burke. Thank you, Dr. David Bob. And thank you, Dr. Jeff Sakanga. And I think, um, Jeff, you really wrapped this session up. You know, we want um, we believe and we understand that the formula on American exceptionalism and teaching it civics is rooted in keeping it local, ensuring that parents are involved and engaged, that we preserve the quality of the curricula um, that, that's being taught, and that we at all points have um, those, those, um, those pillars that insist on accountability. So we thank you all uh, for loving this nation the way that you do and for all the work that you have um, provided and the resources that you continue to give and your expertise. So Andy, back over to you. Thank you very much, Angela. Thank you, David and Jeff, for your comments today and the work that you do every day. And also thank you to Lindsay and Angela for leading the conversation for us at Heritage and for all that you do to shape this conversation nationally. We'd like to thank everybody for joining us and for all the questions. It's hard to get to all of them. Uh, if you have anything that you would like answered, please feel free to email me directly, andrew.alabastro at heritage.org. We appreciate the ongoing feedback that we receive from the short email survey that follows these sessions. And please go to resourcebank.org for these recordings and upcoming programs. And please go and enjoy this exceptional country of ours, America. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>